The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 5, 17 through 20, the New Revised Standard Version. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth passes away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is full accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of these least of these commandments in the kingdom of heaven, no, 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 no. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so in, is the least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. So we're in a series talking about the Bible. How we read it, what it is, what it isn't. My goal in this series has been to bring to consciousness for all of us, for you and for me, things that we assume every time we open the Bible. Assumptions we bring to the text when we read it in a public setting like this or in a private setting like our own bedrooms. I want us to think deeply about the Bible. I want you to be people who can talk about the Bible in public, about why you hold to this text and hold to this one rather lightly. How you make sense of the, this one in a literal way, but this one in a metaphorical way. The last two weeks of this series is today and next week. And it seems fitting to me that we would look at how Jesus read the Bible today and next week. I also want you to know that on two consecutive Wednesday nights, March 8th and March 15th, I'm going to have a Q&A session on Wednesday night here in the church to talk about the Bible and how we interpret the Bible well and faithfully. If I have prompted questions up to this point or do today or next week, I would encourage you to come and let's just have a conversation about the Bible, how we go about reading it faithfully and well. Uh, so today, as, as has been true in the last several weeks, will be more teaching than preaching. I hope that's okay with you. Uh, but bring all that you are today, and I'll try to bring all of me too. Rivers have always been a huge part of my life. Whenever someone asks me where I'm from, I usually reply, the Delta of Arkansas. Partly because the towns are so small, nobody's ever heard of them anyway. But also, when, when people ask me where I'm from, I kind of want to tell them my life has been oriented around rivers. The Lane Gill River runs through my family farm. I'm pretty sure that Lane Gill is a French word for muddy as heck. <laughs> Come to think of it, everywhere I've ever lived, Waco, Oklahoma City, it's had a river that ran through it. And today we all gather in the River City to worship God. I guess that's true for most people throughout history. You have to have water to live. And if, so if you don't live on a shore of a sea or ocean or anything like that, you probably live close to a river. Did you know that rivers haven't just played a vital role in the geography of the world, but also in the philosophy of the world as well? Before the days of Socrates and Plato, there were two Greek philosophers who had fundamentally different views of reality. Their names were Heroc I can't say his name. Heraclitus and Parmenides. Heraclitus believed that reality is fundamentally in flux. That reality is always changing. The essence of reality is change. To live is to be in a state of becoming. You are changing. The world around you is changing at every moment. He was known to have said... No man ever steps into the same river twice, for the river is a different river, and the man is a different man. Reality in his mind was constant change. 
Parmenides couldn't, couldn't disagree more with his contemporary. Parmenides believed that reality was fundamentally static and stable. We're not in a state of becoming, we're in a state of being, he argued. And change is merely illusory. Things don't change, we just have the perception that things change. But nothing ever really changes. He would no doubt agree with the statement that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And he would no doubt lead us down to the Arkansas River after worship today and would point out to us that the Arkansas River is today where the Arkansas River has always been. He would show us the little rock that De La Hart found when he was exploring the river centuries ago. The river doesn't change, it's the same river. Have you ever thought about it? I would encourage you to today as you drive across the river, the next time you drive across any river, I would invite you to think about it. Do you believe that river is always changing? Or do you believe that river is always the same? What do you believe? Another way to think about this is in terms of our bodies. To be sure there is a constancy about our bodies. That mole that's on your right shoulder that was there on the day you were born is still there today. It hasn't changed. It's still there. People who haven't seen you in ten years can still recognize you. Some aspects of your body stay the same. It's why a medical history has any weight to it at all. There's some constancy about ourselves. But studies also show that every cell in your body reproduces itself every seven to ten years. And some much more rapidly than that. Which is to say that about every seven to ten years, at a cellular level, you have a brand new body. What that means is... You're as young as you were 10 years ago, right? That's the way I hear it. Go look at a picture of yourself 10 years ago. Ask yourself, are you the same or have you changed? I saw a picture of me from 10 years ago, just a couple of weeks ago. In some ways, I could tell it was me. And in some ways, I thought, my God, I am dying. I really am dying rapidly. For centuries, philosophers have debated this. This continuity, discontinuity aspect of reality. Things are always the same. Being. Things are always changing. Becoming. And it seems to me the debate is still ongoing in much of our social, religious, and political dialogue today. More specifically, I'm talking in terms of conservatives and liberals. Now, most people today use those terms pejoratively, although some people wear them like badges. I'm a conservative. I'm a liberal. But most of the time, a conservative or a liberal is what someone else calls you. It's what we call other people. And I'm convinced, as is true with most of the labels we use, over the course of time we've stretched them so far, no one really knows what either one of those words means today. We just know it's something you don't want to be. Or something you do, depending on your voting block. But historically, those words have not been bad words. The word conservative is not a bad word. It recognizes that some things in this world are worth conserving. There are some things that are true in every age and should be maintained over the course of time. The river doesn't change. It's in the same place it always has been. Some truth is eternal and timeless and should be preserved from generation to generation. If you think about it, we do a most conservative thing every Sunday when we gather in this room. I don't know if you've thought about it. Every Sunday we gather in this room and we open up a book that's over 2,000 years old. Simply doing so is an act of conservation. It's a conservative act to open up the Bible and read it. In most fields today, people say, have you read the new book on? In most fields, we, we prize the newest learning, the newest book. Can you imagine today if you walked up to somebody and said, have you read the oldest book on? Fill in the blank. 
And yet, we gather in the church Sunday after Sunday and we open up the oldest thing that most of us encounter on any given week. And we read from it and we give it credence and cred credibility in the deepest parts of our being. It's a very conservative thing to do. But the word liberal is also a good word. Many of you in this room today graduated from a liberal arts college. I graduated from a conservative liberal arts college. Mind blown, I know. Maybe that's why I'm all screwed up. The etymology of the word liberal has to do with the concept of freedom. It's why it sounds like the word liberation. A liberal is one who prizes liberation. A liberal education back in the day was an education for a free person. You didn't go to a technical school to learn a trade. You were a free person. You went to learn how to be something, not how to do something. Liberal arts. Just as conservatives believe some things need to be preserved, liberals believe that some things need to be liberated. We need tradition, yes, but sometimes we need to be liberated from tradition. We need to recover tradition, yes. Sometimes we need to recover from tradition. We all gather in a Baptist church today. We would say we're something like grandchildren of the Protestant Reformation. What were they protesting? The tradition of the church. You're gathering today in a Protestant congregation. We need to recover tradition and yet at the same time recover from it. And, don't know if you thought about this or not, but every Sunday we do a most liberal thing in our worship service. After we read scriptures from a book that's 2,000 years old, I stand up and preach. 35 years old, frail creature of dust. Why do I do that? Why do you let me do that? a dangerous question to ask. I'm sure you've left more than one Sunday saying, why do we let him do that? <laughs> Seriously though, might I ask you to ponder today? If this is the Word of God and I'm a frail creature of dust, wouldn't it be in all of our best interest for me to just read from the book for 20 to 30 minutes? Wouldn't that be more redemptive and life-giving? Wouldn't it? But I think I preach. And I think you let me preach, first of all, to be sure I do something throughout the week. But secondly, we believe that this text has something to do with our lives today. And the pulpit is where we try to connect the tradition to the liberation of today. How this makes sense in, in all of this. Every Sunday... We do a most conservative thing and a most liberal thing in very close proximity, which is a way of saying we need to recover tradition and be liberated from it all at the same time. Every Sunday we read from an archaic text, you could argue. And on every Sunday we talk about our lives and how this text inter intersects our lives. Similar to when someone buys an old house. They do so for the character of the home. There's something about that old house that differentiated it from all the other homes. It has a history. It has meaning. They bought that house for that house. But in order to keep that house a house, you have to update it. You have to replace the floors and fix the leak and paint the walls and update the kitchen. You get the idea, I hope. The river is always changing and always the same. Your body is always changing and somehow the same. The house is what you purchased but also what you've made it. To be alive as a person, to be alive as an organization is to live with some mixture of continuity and discontinuity all at the same time. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. For I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. 
Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. These are the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. But could they not be the words of someone preaching in any conservative church around this city today? That sounds like a most conservative thing for Jesus to say. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. They still stand. They're still binding. I don't even know many conservatives that would say that today. This is more conservative than conservatives. Jesus is appealing to their ancient roots here, their covenant with God. He sounds extremely, extremely conservative. And yet, why do you think Jesus would say, don't go thinking I've come to abolish the law and the prophets? Why would he say that? Because the people were thinking that he was abolishing the law and the prophets. In the, the text immediately preceding this, Jesus looked at his followers and he said, You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Throughout the Old Testament, that image of light had been applied to Jewish people, and more specifically Jerusalem, and more specifically the temple in Jerusalem, was the light of the world. It was an Old Testament tradition. And here Jesus takes that tradition and completely metamorphosizes it. He redefines it. You, my followers, are the light of the world. He completely changed the tradition in the Scriptures. And in the verses that follow, Jesus comes across as a raging liberal. In fact, for most liberals in our day-to-day, -day, the Sermon on the Mount is the pinnacle of Scripture. Matthew 5-7, to this is breeding ground for liberals in the Bible. Think about what Jesus says here. He quotes from the law, sometimes from the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, he quotes a commandment. And then he says... But I say to you, what? How can he say that? You've heard it said, don't murder. Yeah, God said that. But I say to you, you better deal with your anger and proactively seek reconciliation or you've missed the whole point. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, you better, you better deal with your lust. You've heard it said, don't make false vows. But I say to you, just tell the truth. Don't make vows at all. You've heard it said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, turn the other cheek or you'll spend your life slapping other people. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. In each of these ways, Jesus quotes the law and radically reinterprets what that means and how His people are to live into it. In each of these commandments, Jesus is getting at the purpose of the commands, not just the content of them, which is a radically different way of reading the Bible. The purpose of the commands, not just the content of them. Don't murder didn't just mean don't pull a trigger. It means handle your disputes redemptively. Adultery doesn't just have to do with spouses cheating, but it has to do with lusting after a person that they become more of an object than a subject, even in our minds. Here, Jesus is getting at the heart of the law, which is to say He's removing everything that's peripheral to it, but He's clinging to everything that is at the core of it. He is both a liberal and a conservative with the law. And this is where the Bible begins to push against the boundaries of our frail humanity. This is where the Bible starts to demand something of us if we are to be readers of it at all. Were you to give a script to two actors, they have the same lines on the script, they have the same stage direct directions. But the script goes to two different actors or actresses. Is it the same? No. And why? Were you to give me a sheet of paper, a sheet of uh, a hymn, music, paper. You can tell how much I know about music, right? And give one to Suzanne. 
and us both sit down at the piano and indulge me for a second and pretend that I hit all the right notes. Give me that. I hit all the right notes. Will it sound the same? No. And why? I'm trying to teach fourth and fifth grade boys how to play basketball. Here's what you do, here's what you don't do. A few weeks ago, I'm sitting in the living room with the boys and we're watching NBA basketball. I'm watching these guys who've turned basketball into an art form. They're spectacular with the basketball. It comes so naturally to them. It's like an extension of their body. And I'm realizing they're breaking every rule that I'm telling the fourth and fifth grade boys to observe. And it's an art form. They're fulfilling the game and changing the game all at the same time, even as they play it. Perhaps Picasso said it best when he said, learn the rules like a pro so that you can break them like an artist. Or maybe St. Augustine had it right when he was talking about Christian morals and he said, love God and do as you please. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law. You've heard it said, but I say to you, is the river ever changing or is it always and forever the same? Here, Jesus sounds more conservative than conservatives and He sounds more liberal than liberals. Maybe that's why no one invested in organized religion could hear a word he was saying in his day. In fact, he calls them out on it. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness... That's an important word in the Gospel of Matthew. It is the word in the Gospel of Matthew. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Do you know when the first time that word righteousness shows up in the gospel? It shows up in reference to Jesus' dad, Joseph, back in chapter 1. Joseph had just found out that his betrothed wife, Mary, was pregnant before he had ever known her. Do you know what the law says about that? Do you know what the law says plainly and clearly? About that, Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24, bring the betrothed woman and the man who lies with her into the city gates and stone them. Clearly, black and white. Now I know some folks who would say to Joseph, now you just have to obey the Bible. Obey the Bible and you can't go wrong. Just do what it says. It's the right thing to do. But in the text, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, the text says Joseph was planning on putting her away quietly because he was a righteous man. What makes him righteous? Joseph had read his Bible on this, no doubt. But he also knew something of the character of God. And while the law prevented him from marrying Mary, God prevented him from shaming her or ridiculing her or embarrassing her or demeaning her. You see, brothers and sisters, some people get an A in Bible, but get an F in God, which is to get an F. Joseph was a righteous man, which means he enacted the script in the right way and he knew when to improvise. He played the same notes as the Pharisees, but he played them with humility and mercy and grace, which produces a different kind of music, you see. And that's where most traditional religion of scribes and Pharisees, and dare I say, of both conservatives and liberals, that cannot teach you that. Organized religion cannot teach that to you. They can teach you the notes, but they can't teach you the tune. They can give you the script, but they can't give you the character. Organized religion cannot get to the heart of the matter, the depth of the matter. And I think that's why Jesus here sounds like both a conservative and a liberal. 
It's because we're hearing Him in a world where everything is left and right and He is calling us deeper. What does a scale of left to right mean for us today when Jesus is calling us deeper? Do you think God is on the throne today saying, Boy, I just wish I had more conservatives. Do you think God is on the throne today saying, Man, if I just could get a few... Where have all the liberals gone? I need a few more liberals. I do not. Either way. I do in fact believe that God is on the throne saying, Where have all the deep people gone? The deep people who will be salt and who will be light. I'm not talking about moderates. Yuck! Who, who wants to be a moderate? That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about radicals. Do you know where the word radical comes from? It comes from the Latin word radix, which is the Latin word for root. Radish. A radical is someone who gets at the root of something. Traditional religion can argue about what makes murder, murder, but it can't give you a passion for life in all its forms. Traditional religion can offer you plenty of guilt and shame about adultery and sex, but Jesus calls us to the deeper place where we objectify people in our brains. Traditional religion can teach us how to love those who are just like us. But to, to love our enemies means we have to experience something deeper still. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not get it. And brothers and sisters, when you take transformation out of the Christian faith, all you have are the trappings of it which is how mostly conservative and mostly liberal churches, that's what they have today, are the trappings of the Christian faith. When you remove the journey towards Christ-likeness and the mimicry of God, you get the shells, the hollow shells of faith. Conservatives are left with their yearnings for yesterday or their civil religion or their love to think about the afterlife. Liberals are left with this nebulous idea that things will just get better with time. Life's getting better, right? Or the hollow shell of moralism where every sermon is about right and wrong. Perhaps the reason the faith is so politicized today and everybody's moving right and left is that we've forgotten that Jesus is calling us all deeper. But it's easier to go right and it's easier to go left than it, is, than it is to go deep. Here's how I imagine it going today. Leave with this. I imagine Heraclitus and Parmenides meeting us all at the door when we get out today and saying, come down to the river. I imagine Parmenides saying, have you ever thought about how old this river is? Historical, unchanging. And I imagine Heraclitus saying, Are you kidding me? The river is always in motion. It's a different river every minute. It's different than it was a second ago. It's not the same river. I imagine conservatives gathering at the river and talking about how things used to be. I imagine liberals saying, It's 2017. What in the heck's going on? And all the while we're talking about change or not change, left or right, I imagine Jesus standing knee-deep in the river saying, come on in, the water's fine. If you guys stand up there and talk about left and right, you'll forget to dive in. And there's only one way to really get to know a river, right? There's also only one way to really get to know God. There is no conservative way to be transformed. There is no liberal way to be transformed. There's only God's way. Now this way of thinking shakes things up. 
It doesn't register on our scales or spectrums. It's not easily classified. It feels like it belongs to a different reality altogether. Which is why people on the right and the left wanted to kill him. Some of them good old church folks who were thumping their Bibles all the way to the cross. But it's also why others at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of chapter 7, they're amazed at his teaching, the text says. Because he taught as one having authority, not as their scribes. Which might mean that they knew he was saying something that was both timeless and timely. Brothers and sisters, unless our righteousness exceeds that of conservatives and liberals, we will never see the kingdom of God. When you stand before God, I don't think He will ask you, now were you conservative enough? And when we stand before God, I do not think He will ask us, now just how liberal were you? When we stand before God, I think He will say, now how much like Jesus were you? How much were you willing to be transformed? How deep were you willing to dive? How much of a radical were you? And with that in mind, the great question for us today isn't whether or not we read our Bibles. That's not the question. The question for us today is whether or not we read our Bibles like Jesus did. The question for us today isn't whether the river is ever changing or always the same. The question for us is whether or not we will be people who are willing to dive in deep. That's the question. And if that makes us liberal, so be it. And if that makes us conservative, so be it. But if that makes us Christian, whew, hallelujah. Let's pray. Oh Lord, turn our eyes upon Jesus. Help us to look full in His wonderful face. So that in our delight in Him, we become like Him. Not just in the way He treated His people, but in the way He treated His Bible. Give us wisdom to know the purpose of things. And give us courage enough to live it. For we would see Jesus. It's in His name we pray, because it's in His name that we live. Amen.